This is episode number 45, Find Your Inner Strength, with Janet Yoff. Welcome, my name is Oleg Lohid, and this is the Overcoming Odds Podcast, where you get a glimpse into the stories of individuals who have overcome adversity, suffering, and struggle in achieving their personal success. This podcast was built by you and for you to help you overcome adversity, suffering, and struggle in achieving your fullest potential. Before I introduce today's guest, I would like to make a brief announcement and invite all of our listeners to an upcoming event in Los Angeles on February 23rd called Survive to Thrive an event where you'll have a chance to connect with hundreds of people who are going through a similar transformation that you are. An event where you'll get a chance to hear from seven speakers from all over the country. Each one has been adopted or in foster care, and each one is here to share the different methods they've learned during times when they had to survive that are helping them thrive in today's world. For more information, please go to overcomingodds.today forward slash survive to thrive. Now, let's get back to our guest. Expert in adoption and foster care, psychotherapist, author, advocate for ending childhood trauma. She has been speaking on this subject for over 20 years. It all began when a little girl who auditioned for a family at age of seven and a half This life event has tested her and became her greatest teacher. She strives to help others regain self-acceptance, self-understanding, and self-worth. Without further ado, please welcome Janet Yoff. Jeanette, welcome to their show. Thank you so much, Oleg. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And what I wanted to do in the way that I wanted to start off this particular episode of Finding Your Inner Strength is for those who aren't familiar with your story and your background, would you be willing to share with our listeners a little bit about your upbringing as far back as you can remember? Yes. Uh, Yes, sure. Um, Well, I am originally from New York. Um, I was born in New York City. I lived with my birth family for 15 months. Um, My mother had some mental illness. I was then placed in foster care on Long Island. And I remained in foster care for six and a half years. And then they were attempting at that time in the late 70s for me to go and reunify with some relatives in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mother is native Argentinian um, because my mother could not parent me and my brother. I also have a younger sibling who was also placed in the foster care system in the Bronx. So we were separated. Um, We did not end up going back to Argentina. We stayed in the United States and we went to uh, adoptive families. So then I was placed in another family at the age of seven and a half, uh, which was a very critical point in my development and impacted my self-esteem and confidence as a child, uh, which has taught me some very great lessons in life and it has been very difficult at the same time. So um, having gone through this experience now uh, at seven and a half, I was adopted, remained in that family, um, until today, mm. they are my family and um, uh, have been very supportive. Um, and I had many opportunities. And then mm. I also did have reunion uh, and searched for my birth mother uh, because I yearned for her and I knew that I had formed an attachment to her. So it was very painful for me to have been separated from her. So I searched for her for 10 years with my brother. We finally found her. And then we both of us went and flew to Argentina to meet our birth mother, who was in a mental institution for 20 years. 
and was receiving psychiatric care um, in Argentina and found out that she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, I then became a psychotherapist uh, in my time of really understanding what had happened to her and what happens to the mind. Mm -hmm. And I then indulged myself in understanding the psychology of the mind and trauma and grief and loss because I had suffered many years and started therapy myself at the age of 13 uh, because I tried to attempt to end my life. Um, my, I had two younger siblings who were also adopted. We also fostered a child and she was with us for three years. And then she was reunified with her mother. And I was about 12 and I saw this whole process happen for her. And I'm thinking, where's my mommy? Mm. And how come she doesn't want me and where is she? So it became this constant wondering and thinking and I did not I, I uh, my parents had found a therapist for me but they were not adoption or foster care competent mm -hmm. which is what I thrive to do with my work because I come from the experience I'm so much more able to have impact on children and adults and parents and families um, because I know the experience very well so, um, yeah, so I became a therapist. I had a reunion with my birth mother. Now I work with children and families here in Los Angeles, all connected by foster care and adoption. And like yourself, I started a nonprofit called Celia Center, which is named after my birth mother, Celia. Mm -hmm. Birth mother, first mother, there's a lot of politics in adoption. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, some birth mothers do, some don't. Um, but I consider her my first mother because I did live with her for 15 months. And when I found her and she spoke to me, she did tell me I she never forgot about me. And she always loved me, which was very important for me to hear. Especially at that age. Yes. Um, well, when I found her as an adult, this is what she told me. Because mm -hmm. I, I didn't know her. I had seen a picture of her when I was in my early 20s, and I just was so shocked at how much I looked like her. And I recently posted a photo on Instagram of her and me at the same age, and just the resemblance is just startling because we don't have that mirroring. And as adults, we can recreate that mm -hmm. for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I'm putting the pieces together now as an adult. And I always tell anyone who has had this experience of foster care and adoption, it is a never ending. Mm -hmm. It is a lifelong process. Don't think it's over. It's learning how to manage these parts of you. And what has helped me the most is breaking it down into parts so I don't feel so overwhelmed that it's when I'm experiencing, whether it's my grief, my stress, questioning, wondering, I always tell myself, this is a part of yourself you're experiencing. It's not all of you. It's a part of you because then I can have what's called objectivity. I can separate from it and I can reflect on it and I can learn what to do with this part give it the attention it needs. And the biggest piece for, and you can speak to this too, for the adoptee or foster mm -hmm. youth, we need a lot of validation that we exist because there's a part of us that feels like, do I belong? Do I exist? Do I matter? Am I important? Uh, so we need to learn, and I call it reparenting, re-messaging, re, <laughs> re uh, creating for ourselves a new way of talking to ourselves, a new way of being with all of our parts and validating our parts because we tend to be adaptees. Okay. We're ad always adapting. We're not mm -hmm. adapting. We're adaptees. Mm -hmm. 
then we're seeking all this validation from the world outside of ourselves. And guess what? We are going to be disappointed because mm -hmm. we are not going to get what we want. So we need to accept we need to do it for ourselves internally because seeking it outside, we are going to be disappointed. We can't control the external factors. We can only manage the internal. Yeah. So reorganizing those parts, sorting out those parts. I help young kids sort out these parts mm -hmm. by drawing a person on a piece of paper and then literally putting envelopes, <laughs> naming each part. And then on index cards, saying what this part is saying, what it needs to say, what it needs, and what, how we can help this part. And that's a child intervention, but this can also be applied to adults. That's beautiful. It's organizing that for yourself. I have so many yeah. questions when, yes. when, when you're talking about this. And before I jump back and go into the parts that where you had mentioned about your, your sibling and how you guys have lived in different um, households, the question I had there is, were you guys able to stay in touch? And if so, how difficult was that? Like, how did that impact your relationship, knowing that you did not share the same household as your sibling? Well, um, he had searched for me for four years. I was, I had moved around, so I left home. I was living in the city, New York City, for many years, and then I moved to Brooklyn because I had decided that I was going to move to Los Angeles. So the year that I decided to move to Los Angeles, here I was in Brooklyn, and he... I received a phone call. So I didn't know where he was. I did not know anything about him other than he was adopted by another family. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we had had one visit together. I was six. He was five or four and a half in my foster home. And the social worker told us that we were going to have passports made and go live with an aunt in Argentina. So we met, and that was a very confusing that his social worker brought him to my foster home, and I got to see this little kid who looked exactly like me. And it was very confusing because I had no one helping me understand what was happening. Mm. And then we went to Burger King. We had our passports made. <laughs> and then, I swear, we never saw each other again. Wow. So I was a kid who had to repress a lot stuff. I had a lot of anxiety as a kid and I was always pushing things down because no one was telling me otherwise. Um, and no one was opening a dialogue with me. So I was ashamed about all these thoughts and feelings I was had. So I said, Oh, just push it down and just adapt, be the adaptee, mm -hmm. show everything's okay. Uh, when it really wasn't <laughs> inside, I was a volcano. So going back to my brother, so he found me, he had called, oh yeah, he went, and every state is different, he went to the New York Public Library, and they have birth indexes. So he knew my birth date, he looked in the birth index, and because he knew his birth name, um, and he looked up my name and found me, and then started looking all over the place, and I think I had had a website at that time because I had written a one woman play about my adoption experience and I was used, utilizing the expressive arts to make sense of what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I was writing. And so he called my mother. My mother gave him my number, but she didn't know that he was my brother because he didn't want to tell her. He didn't want anyone to s scare me off. You know, Surprise. If I, Yes, surprise. So my mother did say to me, some boy called here, and I gave him your number. I hope that's okay. But he, he said he knew you. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, so then I put two and two together because when he, I received a message that from a woman who said, I have information about your biological family, I would like to speak with you and share more. Please be available the next day at like 9 p.m. 
which is great because I'm like, great, I'll be take off work. We'll be sitting at the phone waiting for her phone call. So the next day, sitting there waiting for her phone call, the phone rings. I pick it up and it's a male voice. And he sounds kind of odd. He's like, hello. <laughs> I'm expecting this woman's voice. And I'm like, hello. And he says, is this Jeanette? I said, yes, this is Jeanette. I'm annoyed because I'm like, this is not the call I'm waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it's Patrick. That's all he had to say. And did you remember and his I name just, to that point? Yes, I knew his name was Patrick. And I just dropped the phone and then realized he was my brother. Wow. My long lost brother. And I have emotions right now. And I'm an adult. And this part of me became so excited. There were so many feelings. I was excited. I was scared. I was grief stricken. I was emotional because of the loss of having not known him. For this was, we were in our 20s for many, many years. I saw him when I was six. It had been over 20 years. So he said, that was my girlfriend. So I finally get the phone. And I'm like, Patrick, where are you? He's like, I live in the Bronx. He, I said, is this the call that I'm expecting? He goes, yeah, that's my girlfriend. <laughs> I didn't <sighs> scare you. So we ended up meeting. We wanted to make it very special on top of the Empire State Building. <laughs> oh, wow. And he showed me a picture of our birth mother, whom he received the photo from our birth father, who I told him I found him four years ago. And he said, yes, I also found him. Mm. And he also he find you. And I said, oh, and he writes you back? He said, Yes, he did. And he wrote him this long, long guilt letter stating some reasons why he could not parent both of us and why he did choose to surrender us to the foster care system and ultimately become adopted. Um, so we, surprisingly, because you ask about the sibling relationship, meeting mm -hmm. as adults, we ended up going to a park and we went on some swing sets, you know, we went on a swing together and you regress when you have reunion and we regressed because we both looked at each other and said, we wished we could have done this when we were kids and we didn't have that opportunity, but we can do it now. So we've been growing up together as adults and that's, That's the repair that we get to do. Now, is it painful? Of course, because mm -hmm. it triggers that you you love. It's it's the dynamic of yin and yang. It's the love, and then there's the pain associated with that love and loss. And you don't know what to expect on a daily basis as, yes. as far as what's going to come with that relationship from one day to another because you guys are different humans at the end of the day. And he may be going through something completely different than what you've experienced with this journey. Yes. And we've, you know, we've had our ups and downs when, after we had our initial reunion, we'd spent a few more times together, but I then was, I had plans. I'm moving to California. So I left and the relationship became very, uh, it kind of went on the shelf. It just, I, parts of me felt like, okay, that was enough for me. And I really needed to take care of myself. It just brought up a lot. I needed a lot of autonomy, a lot of space in that. And he wanted more. He really wanted his big sister. And I felt for me, it was more emotional. So he was really eager and I was feeling more, I need some space. So it became a difficult period for us for a couple of years until I started coming around the corner and I said, you know what? I do want this, but I had to work on my grief and loss because here's the thing, Oleg, he did not have the same experience as me. Mm -hmm. He one family. 
I lived in multiple families and I had more pain associated with my loss than he did. Um, I had more challenges. I had more anxiety. I had more to adapt to. I was more vulnerable than he was. He had a stronger sense of self, um, which gave him the sense of security to jump all in. For me, it was, okay, I need to settle myself here. Wait a second. Mm -hmm. uh, just uprooted me. Um, so it is different for everyone. And, you know, it's so hard because as much as someone wants reunion, the other person, whether it's the birth mother, birth father, sibling, they may not be ready. And I always say this, it's not a rejection of you. It is a reflection of them and their experience and what they're feeling and what they need to reflect on. Mm -hmm. And it's their own fear. All resistance is fear. And it's scary. to Because when you have reunion, you do need to look at yourself. And mm -hmm. you're going to feel something. And it's going to be emotional. It's going to be vulnerable. And before, just to go back, because this is a podcast and, you know, we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. I've been in therapy since the age of 13 and I'm still in therapy. <laughs> I don't think we ever escaped that subject. Right. At it's least okay not in this lifetime. Healthy. Yeah, it's not shaming to go into therapy. It's actually, it's your strength. And that's the topic of this. It's finding your strength. It's connecting with that part of you that is strong, that that is that has gone through this very difficult experience, that has overcome, as you talk about, that has worked through. We don't get over things. We move through things, and you need someone to be there with you through your processing because what's shareable is bearable within yourself. Mm. We do to be with someone else. You can't do this work all by yourself. Wow, that's beautiful. So there. <sighs> yes. I have my, done a lot of work mm -hmm. internally. My question for you not, is where yes. where do you look for strength, especially during times of adversity? Because a lot of the things that you've shared with us regarding your journey I mean, there were definitely some moments where you mentioned you dealt with anxiety and depression and things like that. Not exactly the happiest of times, as we can describe. So during those moments, how do you how do you regain that strength? Like, wait, where do you start looking for those, for some of the listeners right now who may be experiencing something like this, such as a breakup or they've had a rough patch within their career or their life in general, how do they regain that strength and almost like get back up on the horse and keep going? Yes, yes. So there's a few things I do. And I'm going to say there's three. So there's three practices that I do. The first thing, and this is a tool I learned a while ago that I practice and teach anyone who comes in my um, circle, my meetings, my support groups, my office. So it's a grounding tool. And if I can guide us right now, if that's okay, it'll take three minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a grounding tool. So basically, I want you to just stand on your two feet. You need to stand up and put your feet foot apart. You're just going to follow my lead, and I'm going to access your imagination because our imagination is the most powerful tool we have, and it's a resource that we can pull on at any time. So I want you to imagine from your belly button to the center of this planet, you are connected by a cord, okay? This cord is your connection and yours only. No one can break it. It's connected to, to you like a suction to your belly button. So feel the suction of a cord from your belly button to the center of this planet. And I really want you to trust me because some people laugh and think it's funny. When you really can access this, it's very powerful. And you will want to do this for yourself. So in imagining your cord, I want you to see your cord and see what it's made of. Is it made of steel, solid steel? Because this is unbreakable. Mm -hmm. Is it made of titanium? 
really give it that identification of what it's made of and see it. Is it rope? Whatever you can imagine is fine, is right. There's no wrong. So once you feel that cord connection, you can ask someone around you to give you a little push on your shoulders. And what you're going to feel is this sense of strength in your body that you've never felt before. A fullness, a connection, a sense of belonging, a sense of I belong here too, just like everybody else. And for me, I do this all the time, all the time, before I'm anticipating a stressful event before leaving my home, before walking in a meeting, before I do a talk, I will ground myself. And that grounding actually helps me think clearer, be more in my body, less in my head, so that I'm speaking from my inner voice, the mm. core of who I am. And that's where we want to speak from. We don't want to speak from our head. Mm -hmm. there's many thoughts in there and so I can talk about a mindfulness tool so that we can separate from our thoughts and again get into our bodies and come from a place of feeling centered whole regardless of what happened to us we can still feel a sense of wholeness and connectedness and belonging because we all matter. We are all different beings. We all come from different places and experiences. And we are each individually unique. Mm -hmm. This is incredible if you really think about it. We all individually have so much to offer and share and learn from one another. No two people are the same. So your cord connection is your connection to this planet and most importantly to yourself mm -hmm. so that's one thing that i do you, you you spoke a little bit about speaking from your inner self yeah. instead of speaking from your head and the question that i have there is kind of from my own personal experience of learning yes. over time the power of positive self-talk mm -hmm. and what i've learned is that it is, at least based on my understanding, positive self-talk does come from your, it is your inner voice. And so the, the question I have there is for those who may not have mastered certain parts of positive self-talk. So where, when they get up in the morning, the first thing that comes to them is or are words of encouragement. How, where do people start? When they're if they're if that's a battle that they're trying to resolve or soften or get better at, how do you start with that if that's not what you were taught to begin with? Right. And like, what do you have any tools, books, or anything like that that people can start with, or even a simple practice that they can do on a daily basis? Yes. Um, well, there's a tool from a CD called "The Mindful Way Through Depression" mm -hmm. by John Habits in. Fabulous CD, a lot of meditations on there. So one of the tools that they teach is River of Thoughts. Now, I incorporate two pieces in here. There's a book that I read. It's called How God Changes Your Brain by Andrew Newberg. He's a medical doctor. And he also talks about the science of spirituality and reshaping our brains so that we can live that whole life and it has nothing to do with religion it's just connecting to the higher sense that we're all connected we can all feel good about ourselves have self self love for ourselves and also for others so this book talks about whenever you have one negative thought the first thing we need to do is acknowledge it because here's the science be behind the mind the more you resist something the greater it will persist. Mm -hmm. So if I tell you, don't think about a white bear, go <laughs> ahead. What are you going to do? Think about the white bear. Exactly. So 
your brain is highly suggestive. It's going to think and it's going to receive messages from all over the place. So the one, the first wonderful thing is you don't have to believe everything you think because the mind is an incredibly impressionable organ. It's going to suggest things constantly, negative and positive. Okay, so you don't have to believe everything you think. When I heard that concept, I'm like, that actually gave me some sense of it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't have to believe everything I'm thinking. Number one. Number two, when you are having, so the river of thoughts, when you are having that negative internal messaging, okay, we must acknowledge it and acknowledge it as, okay, you're here. All right, I, I see you. You're telling me that a negative thought from me that comes up is you're not good enough. That, that's a common thought for me. And so here's the message. You have to acknowledge, okay, there's my part telling me I'm not good enough. Then I have to go and, not but, because that's resisting it. I have to go and, because I need to learn to befriend and help this part or else it's going to slay me like a dragon, mm -hmm. like the, the um, wounded healer, the Jungian archetype. This dragon will slay me if I don't befriend it and look it in the eye and go, okay, there you are. And I'm now going to suggest three encouraging, positive, supportive, nurturing, loving messages to this part because it needs my help and it needs support. So then I will say, and you're doing the best that you can and that's good enough. Now here's the thing you probably didn't recognize when I said this. I don't say I am mm -hmm. doing the best I can. I say you are doing the best that you can. Mm. And what And what is the reason behind that? There is science that talks about, I only speaks to the ego. You speaks to the soul. Hmm. It downloads deeper messaging, like you were saying, into your core self. And I don't have the, I can, if you want the scientific data on that, I don't have it at my fingertips right now, but I mm -hmm. can get it for you if you want to see it. And if you think about it, you can try it in your own mind right now or out loud. Say the difference. I'm good enough or you're good enough, just the way that you are. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling and sensation. There's a different resonance because we learn our negative uh, beliefs through you statements. Mm -hmm. You're stupid. You're blah, blah, blah. You're not good enough. Because we receive that and we've downloaded that in the first three years become our blueprint. So whatever someone said to us becomes our core belief system. So we have to, if you think about it, reorganize, re-message that part of us in new you messages, not I messages. <laughs> and the brain needs to hear things over and over and over and over and repetition. Mm -hmm. Like a child an infant, the first year of life, needs to be touched thousands of times to build that brain structure of connection and build and trust. First, develop, exactly. And if they don't have that touch thousands of times and they go into a foster placement, that mother has to go back to that age and do for that child what they did not get. Mm -hmm. I'm an attachment-focused therapist. I, I'm constantly helping parents repair what children did not get at certain ages due to abuse, neglect. So this is our way of reparenting ourselves. So we have to say three. So the science says say three positive, encouraging things to that part of you that you're acknowledging is there. It exists. And I'm going to help this part grow stronger, mm. grow another part that can handle this part and doesn't get self-sabotaged by this part, that can befriend this part, doesn't have to step on this part, but to have compassion for this part. Mm -hmm. Compassion, you know what? 
this part is fucking hurting. Excuse my friend. It's painful and it needs our attention. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question. And if you need to say three more things, it's okay. Three actually, they say, negates the one negative. And mm. that comes from Newberg's uh, mm -hmm. science. Um, and let me tell you something. And I tell people, there's the word is practice. Okay? It's not you have to do this. You get to do this for yourself. It's a practice. When you notice, okay, here comes that negative thought. Okay, see it. You can see it in a circle so that you can have some objectivity. Okay, here comes that negative thought. So then acknowledge it. And let me tell this three things and then move on. You don't have to have an expectation of fixing. There is no fixing. What we're doing is moving through, supporting, encouraging, and the word is managing. Mm -hmm. We can't control it. We can't make it go away. We learn to manage it. Okay. So, uh, oh, so the river of thoughts, and I'll just quickly go over that. So the river of thoughts is this, that's, so that's one tool, but there's this other imagery that you can create for yourself, which comes from that mindful way CD. So just imagine you are in a boat and you're on a river and in the river are all these negative thoughts. And it's like the roaring rapids. Have you ever been on one of those? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> right. It's vicious. More times than I wish to. Uh-huh. <laughs> there are negative thoughts, I feel like, mm. right? So you're like circling, you're bumping into things, you're bumping into all these negative so just imagine again using your imagination. You're, you can close your eyes, just see yourself in this river of thoughts in your boat, and you can't control it. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do, it's out of control. And then in the distance, you're going to see a bank, a beach off to the side. And you're going to see a nice cushy chair or couch or whatever you can imagine that just looks so wonderful that you just want to jump right into it. You're going to pull your canoe over. You're going to go sit in that comfortable chair. There's a table with food or a drink. Take that drink because you have been working so hard. It's exhausting to be in these thoughts. I know. So then you sit back in your chair, and this is where we practice breathing. And I use lavender a lot. Just put a little lavender oil in the palm of your hand. Breathe through your nose. Take a few deep breaths in. And you can sit back in what's called, you're going to be a witness to these river of thoughts that are you're separating from. You see them. You know you can't stop them. But you can watch, watch, watch them go by like a river of thoughts. And what all you can do is learn how to be in your body, breathe, and know that these river of thoughts will pass. They're not going to last forever. And telling yourself this over and over and over, this is not going to last forever. This is going to go by. I can breathe, I can take care of my body and move through this. And in this, you can incorporate, and I'm going to tell myself three encouraging, supportive, nurturing statements. Mm. And I can still feel comfortable in my body if I'm having all of these reverb thoughts. And I don't have to believe anything I'm thinking. They're just thoughts. And I'm doing the best that I can. I'm taking this one practice at a time, and that's good enough. The more we can focus on the body and help, what the phrase is, name it to tame it, these river of thoughts, they're there, okay. And I will be able to work through this. They won't be as intense, as frequent, and last as long because I'm giving them the medicine that they need. And that's that inner work. Um, 
So that's a tool in practice. That's incredible. <laughs> I can definitely sense even within my own body how just doing that, I mean, it definitely changed my state of being from the totally. beginning of this conversation than just being able to follow it. And I think just calm yourself down and level yourself. And the, the thing that you speak about, which constantly goes, I'm going back to, is the relationship. Not only a relationship that you have with other people, but with yourself and just the, the connection that you have to this planet and the frequencies that are surrounding you. I mean, I think once you can get, well, just like you said, grounded and almost align yourself with the frequency of what is outside of you, then that is when you, you get into this phase where you can actually gain that clarity and better understand yourself and yeah. work through a lot of the um, areas that you're trying to work through, which, it, which is very interesting because what this makes me think of is when you were talking about your experience of growing up in, in foster care and then going through the adoption process, how would you say all of that has impacted your relationships moving forward? especially at, at the age that you are at right now. So I, I'm, I'm talking about relationship with significant others, relationships with people that you do business, relationships with clients. How does, how does that impact you down the road, and how can you deal with some of the areas such as trust or abandonment? Let's say in, in a perfect example that I can think of would be you're in a um, – you're in a relationship and you had just experienced a breakup. How do you regain that trust again or the feeling of abandonment? Like how, what, what are some things you can go through on your end to help you overcome that challenge? Okay, so there's a lot there. So, um, okay, so again, I, I always use that phrase, whatever someone, if, if someone... So say, well, let's talk about the breakup. Well, mm -hmm. first of all, actually, let's talk about, then I'll get to that, about relationships. When you do this work, you actually feel, feel closer to people. You feel a greater sense of belonging. All the tools that I've, we've just talked about. Mm -hmm. It actually opens you up to feel more trusting because you know your greatest strength is you. Mm. And here's the piece. When someone has experienced a traumatic incident, multiple events, acute trauma, and then what leads to complex trauma, we tend to live in a place called shame. And there's been a lot of talk about shame with Brene Brown. But when it comes to talking about shame connected to someone who's experienced separation, trauma, uh, trauma with an attachment figure, and when you're a child, you tend to blame yourself. And that's where the concept belief is. There's something wrong about me and I'm bad and I'm, and I'm terrible and see people don't want me and they just abandon me. So that's where that principle comes from. It's all my fault. Mm -hmm. um, so abandonment is that part of you that's telling you you're not good enough. See, nobody wants you. And what we tend to do is if we haven't worked on this part, we continue to abandon ourselves. And I had done one of my support groups, and I've been doing them for nine years now. And I'm in the support group, and I go, you know what we need to do as adult adoptees is we need to learn how to adopt ourselves because we're so good at abandoning ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when someone out here abandons us, or that's the way we perceive it because our baby primal self gets wounded and takes it very personally that they're completely abandoning us when really it's usually about many other things that are outside of us. So we need to separate ourselves from the actions of others and separate ourselves from the actions that we partake in that hurt ourselves. So this is how we need to do this. Mm. And I'm breathing because it's, it's our special need, and I'm not categorizing us as, oh, we're diagnosed with. We have special needs. We have principles and 
we need to be approached a different way and we need to be taught how to approach ourselves a different way. And I've been told, you got to write the book. I'm like, okay, well, I'm <laughs> many other things, you know, like yourself. I'm like, I will get there. However, I'm still putting these principles into practice. So when it comes to shame and the connection to um, feeling abandoned or how do we recover, we first need to work again on ourselves. So shame is like this. When something happens to us as children, children, because they're egotistic and they're narcissistic, they believe it's all about them. They believe it's their fault. They caused this to happen. That's a primal way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's very young thinking. And, a, and most, I'm going to say most, and Dopti can email me and say otherwise, we have a part of ourselves that is primarily wounded because of that early separation. We do believe there's a part of us that it was our fault. Okay. We can be told otherwise through our life that it wasn't about us, but we need the right people telling us that. It wasn't about you. It was about the circumstances in your mother's life at that time that had nothing to do with you. You were a perfectly good and good enough baby. It wasn't about you, but we need to hear that over and over and over. Otherwise, we will believe and still have this wounded baby part. It's all about me. And then what's going to happen if we don't give this part attention when someone outside of us in our perception doesn't want us. Mm -hmm. our, I'm a wound, just like Nancy talks about, Nancy Verrier, will become triggered. And then we will go into this, oh, woe is me. I'm all bad. I'm all wrong. So here's the thing with shame. Shame is like this. It's a bubble. And it surrounds you like a like a bubble. And in the bubble is a mirror of your bad self. And you can't see past the bubble. So when something happens outside of you that's negative, unpleasant, you believe it's your fault. So say you make a mistake on your math test. Mm -hmm. And someone says, oh, look, you've made a mistake. What you hear is, you're the mistake. Mm. Look, done you're wrong so there are some pretty big red flags that you know you're dealing with someone who has a lot of shame and that is they take everything personally they cannot receive constructive criticism um, when they do something wrong they get very wounded narcissistically feeling like they're all wrong and this is how by Polar can begin, borderline personality if they're not treated because they believe as adults that everything is happening because of me. And in reality, it's not. There's usually a good reason or a situation that the person is not wanting to engage in, not because of rejection of you, because it's a reflection of them and their life and what they're going through. So as adults, we need to work on this. And you can hear me talking. I work with a lot of adult adoptees, helping them sort this out. So here's what we need to do. So in this bubble, we have to do what's called the sandwich because this is a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the sandwich is the bread on the bottom is we need to separate ourselves out the bread from the meat, from the lettuce, tomato, the pickle. Okay, so we need to put emphasis on the action, not on us. So we say the bread on the bottom, you're a good person. You're doing the best that you can. And this person is pointing out that the math problem is the mistake. That's the mistake. You're not the mistake. That's outside of you. And the bread on top is you're a good person. I have to teach parents to do this with kids. The sandwich, and I've had parents go, that was the single most important parenting tool I ever received. It shifted everything. Because my the kid who says, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. And the parent goes, you're not stupid, you're not stupid, you're not stupid. They're not helping them. Mm -hmm. They're persisting. It's, well, I'm, 
I see there's a part of you that believes you're stupid. And the parent or the adult realizes, okay, that's my shame part. And I need to say, I'm so sorry. This part of you believes you're stupid. I see another part that is learning how to do this. You're a good person. You're doing the best that you can. The mistake is the mistake. So we need to separate out. We need to do that self-validation. You're a good person. This action that you took, which is outside of you, hmm, that may not have been so good for me. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to learn from this. Put it outside of you. And bread on top, I'm, you're doing the best that you can, and that's good enough. And there are things you can do. So what happens is shame will impede the development of guilt if we don't work on it. So you can hear a lot of people saying, why can't they take responsibility for their actions? Why don't they ever apologize? Because when someone's living in shame, to apologize, it's like reinforcing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm just not good enough. And something was wrong. And there's something wrong about me. They're not able to separate out, wait, you're a good person, and I'm going to apologize about my action. Mm -hmm. That, because this relationship means something to me. Guilt is actually good because it confirms the relationship and you're wanting to make amends. Guilt is actually a good emotion to have. Too much guilt can create, can can regress you to go to a place of shame because you don't know how to manage it because it's getting old. You need to talk with someone about that and externalize it. Um, and make amends. Usually guilt needs action. So, and that's either going to the person, apologizing, speaking to them, or if it doesn't feel safe to go to the person, like sexual assault survivors, you write a letter, perpetrators, people who have done harmful things, you write a letter to that person. It's called Zen and the Art of Writing with no intention of sending it. You just purge yourself. You let it out. You cry. You get angry. You cuss. You do whatever you need to do because you need to get that out of your body because it will impact your daily functioning if you don't. So writing um, also can help you with that. So with abandonment, we have to, as adults, go, abandonment is a very primal way of looking at things. And that's very infantile. We have to reframe that and go, wait a second. The reason, let me think about this. The reasons why my boyfriend and I are no longer, or my girlfriend and I are no longer together. Let me look at all the reasons outside of both of ourselves that led to this conclusion. And reflect on that. Well, there are many things that were happening for both of us. And it's not always about me. And I need to, as an adult, say that to myself. Because my primal wound is getting triggered, believing it's all about me. See, they abandoned me. When if we really do what's called test reality, it's usually not about us. And it's about something we didn't even think about that had nothing to do with us. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, this is, this is why I'm a therapist. I mean, this takes many sessions to work through, mend, write, externalize, talk to this part of you, work through it and you can do it. Journaling, having a listening partner, having someone you can talk to, finding someone who is psychologically mindful because you don't want people, what's hard is. You don't want people trying to fix you or being dismissive, not able to be with your feelings because we need a lot of that too. And that's where, you know, going to a licensed therapist will provide that for you because that is what you need. Mm -hmm. Um, Or someone giving you unsolicited advice and you're like, I just need you to listen to me. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I do support groups and, because not everyone can go to a therapist or feels comfortable. Um, 
but therapy is important and in support groups. Um, and here's the last thing I'm going to say about this. We have needs, the five basic human needs. They all start with the letter A. We all need affection. We all need attention. That's listening to, not fixing. Uh, we all need appreciation. I appreciate you, Oleg, for all the work that you do for the world. You do a lot and you matter and that's important and thank you. You know, you probably don't get a lot of appreciation. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, we all need acknowledgement that we exist and we all need autonomy a long time. So those are our five basic human psychological and emotional needs and we as survivors of any trauma need to learn how to communicate our needs to our significant others, our partners, and say, I just need listening. Please don't fix me. Please let me cry. Please just hold me. Please don't give me advice. I just need you to hold me. But we need to be able to do that. And, and that's our strength. Again, tying on the theme of this talk. When we do that for ourselves, when we get our needs met, we will feel better inside of ourselves and we will do better. When you feel better, you do better. So communicating with others what we need and making sure that they're clear on what we need mm -hmm. and giving that to ourselves, it just it shifts so much. Mm -hmm. Saying, honey, or friend, I just need this. I need some alone time and that be respected. And I think, you know, in, in couples, I've been married 17 years. It takes work. Relationships take work. Mm -hmm. You're always evaluating, okay, what do we need? What do we need to do that shifts things? So we are listening better to each other. Well, we need to establish healthy boundaries. Okay. I need alone time during this time. I need listening time during this time. We need affection. We need to go out on dates. So it, it's determining what, how to meet these five basic human needs. And when you can do the best you can, there's no perfect, but just take it seriously because it's value. The word is value. Mm -hmm. Put these values in your life because when you value yourself, you will value others. Wow. Final. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Um, final thought for today's episode, and that is when the odds are completely against you, what are some core fundamental principles that you always refer to? Well, I, I say this a lot. You are doing the best that you can, and that's good enough. Um, I do say to myself, when you fall, fall reaching. Mm. There's someone who can help you. And I have my circle of people, and I know who I can go to that I trust. When I ask them for a need to be met, they are there to meet that need. Um, fall reaching. And my biggest one is never, never, never give up. Okay. There's always someone much more needy than you because we go again to that primal place of, oh, woe is me. There's no one worse than me. There's always someone who is more needy, more vulnerable. So go out and help someone because mm -hmm. that will make you feel better too. And that's what you're doing. That's what I do. Help someone else. It will lift you up. Because then it also takes you out of your narcissistic wound. It's not all about you. Mm -hmm. It's about us and we. And that's, you can go back to abandoning yourself or you can go to the, and value us and we. And I'm going to go out there and take a risk and volunteer somewhere where you feel, a place you feel passionate about. So never, never give up. Go out and help someone else. Volunteer. If it's an animal, do an animal. I have five cats. <laughs> <laughs> because 
it gives me a sense of well-being and it helps me to it helps me feel good that i'm doing something to help someone else whether it's an animal or a person it gives me greater meaning and greater purpose in my life mm. well said how do people find you and how do people find your work and what are some of the projects that you have coming up in the future that people should know of Okay, so I have three web, no, two websites. <laughs> Actually, three. There's Yoff Therapy. That's my private practice in Los Angeles. Yofftherapy.com. Then I have my nonprofit, which is Celia Center, C E L I A Center.org. That's where all of our support groups are. Um, that's where we do special events. We go to a place called Wolf Connection, which we do a healing there with abandoned wolves, which is very spiritual. Uh, we go on family fishing trips. We have conferences, workshops, trainings, all connected to anyone by foster care and adoption. Kids, young adults, teenagers, and adults and families. Um, and then... Celia Center also now has created a Celia Center Arts Festival, mm -hmm. which will be in April, April 12th and 13th, which will be featuring performers, visual artists who have also experienced foster care and adoption, and they're going to share their stories through visual arts performances. Um, and that will be here in Santa Monica, uh, California. And so that website is celiacenterartsfestival.org. And so I just am channeling all these mediums, support groups, arts festivals, and therapy. And then there's my YouTube channel, Yoff Therapy, which has many videos on an assortment of subjects. If people are wanting to hear more, uh, they can go to that YouTube channel, Yoff Therapy. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you haven't done so already, feel free to subscribe to our weekly newsletter so you can receive all of our latest episodes, featured stand up and speak up stories, and ways you can be involved with overcoming odds. Once again, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you next week.